Hello, Centurion Faith, Brother Jason Worley here, and today I have a message for us on the way to the cross. Here we are with Jesus, and we are going to be going up to Calvary. And starting in Luke 23, 26, and as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon Cyrenian coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Now, this is just a stop right here. Consider this. This man is leaving the country. He's not really much to do with what's going on. And all of a sudden, they're like, hey, you, you're going to carry this. He said, who, me? Yeah, get over here. Well, so he gets to carry the cross for Jesus. Now, when you have someone spotting you and you're working out, you get to a point where you can't lift anymore. You have somebody who takes a very little bit of weight off of you, and it makes it where you can keep pushing on. We have to realize that Jesus, at this point, he'd already been scourged, whipped, beaten, cut down, chewed out. He had he had been brutalized in every single way. His mother couldn't recognize his visage. His face was all just a big old messy pile of blood. He's he has no skin on his back. He probably has just raw meat against that. The splinters poking up against him as he's carrying that cross, and he's doing it because he's doing it for you for me and to take out all the sins of the world he's pushing on but his physical body couldn't take anymore he couldn't take anymore he couldn't take anymore and he dropped he probably dropped to a knee and tried to push up and fell down more and they finally just realized they got to have somebody now even in this situation he's been beaten merciless he's been taken apart he's been whipped he's been tore up our savior was brutalized but god sent mercy to the minds of those people who say get somebody to help him carry that cross you see, and that's that's what the Lord does. Even when we're in the worst of situations, the worst of moments, he'll give us that little bit of mercy. Even if that mercy only comes from the people persecuting us, he'll give us that mercy so that we can have enough just to catch our breath. He'll send mercy. He'll send an angel. He'll send somebody an unaware just so that they can help lift you up to keep you going, to help take that little bit of weight off so you can make it. So you can make it to the goal that God has you set at. It's so important that in our lives, we recognize the crosses that we have to bear and that we bear those burdens and that we carry them. And we also know our limitations. And we also know when we need to take a knee, and we need to cry out for the Lord to send help. And we also know when, and we also have to know when to accept that help and accept that help from others and let them help lift us up so that we can carry on to the goal that the father has for us. Here in 27, and there followed him a great company of people and of women, which was also bewailed and lamenting for him. You see, not everyone was like Peter where they turn tail and run. You had all these women. You had women. They weren't scared of their for their lives. They were they were scared for losing their savior. They were scared for him. They weren't scared for themselves. Neither was John. He was among them. He was with, with Jesus, his mother. Peter, a lot of the other ones, they scattered, but they stayed because they they loved him. They loved him and they weren't going to leave him. But Jesus turned to them and he said, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, blessed are the barren and the womb that never bear. And the paps that never gave suck, as to say, the times that were coming, there was going to be an uprising after this crucifixion, and Jesus knew it. There was going to be a scattering of the Jews, and Jesus knew it. There was going to be much persecution, and Jesus knew it. And he was letting them know it's going to be so bad, it'd be better to never have children than to have a child during this time. Now, these were in time to where they were at. This also pertains to the end times in which we're living. As the world waxes worse and worse, we have to realize uh, time is like an ocean. There's high tide, there's low tide. But as it washes in, it eventually knocks the cliff off and it falls into the ocean. Time repeats itself. History repeats itself. And for that reason, there's many who think that revelation already happened. There's many that think revelation is going to happen or is happening. It is happening. But it also has happened. You see, we have to respectably understand that Jesus 
came into the world in the flesh. And when he came in the flesh, then the whole heavens went to war. You see, because he's absent, he's down on earth. And so he had to go back to keep order there. But when he came to the earth, so did the spirit of Antichrist. It didn't come in our generation. It didn't come in, in a thousand years after Jesus, 2,000 years after Jesus. The spirit of Antichrist has been with us since Jesus walked the earth. There's nothing new under the sun. You see, and he's warning him because what is coming down the pipe after his crucifixion will be affecting them. So he's warning them to be prayerful, to be wise, take for themselves. He's also wanting them not to get caught up in what's going on with him. So here in Luke 23, 30, then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in green tree, what shall be done in the dry? You see, there won't be anywhere to hide when it all comes down. There won't be anyone to go to when it all comes down. There won't be anyone to call out to except for the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's ready, He's getting their minds ready like he's getting our minds ready now. There, the time's coming. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming soon. Whether it be to the forefronts of our minds, to the top of our heart, or on a white cloud, we need to be ready. We need to always be ready. We must be ready to, one, be wise, to know when to stand, when to walk, when to cry, and, and when to hold our own. And the Lord's building an army. You're part of that army. He wants you to be able to bear your cross, and God will not give you more than you need, but call on the help when you need it and receive it. He wants you to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Count your blessings. For these women, the blessing was of the barren womb that you won't have the misery and the hurt of losing your children. Sometimes the things that we lack in life are blessings from the Lord, and we have to recognize that too. Amen? Okay. 31, for if they do these things in the green tree, what shall be done in the dry? They're saying in this, if they're if they're doing things before season, what will they be doing when when things get crazy? Say so he's he's getting he's getting crucified. He's getting he's getting killed by people that a few days ago were saying Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And he's he's getting brutalized by these people these all these happenings are happening fast it went it went from him being praised to him being crucified just just like that so we're talking about a green situation now he's saying if they'll if they'll come in the green of things doing things like this imagine what they'll do when they seasonally think it out what to do with the rest of the jewish people big warning and i believe that's why his people we're following him. Why did the Lord even let them into that situation and endanger themselves crying out after him so he could simply warn them? While he is getting whipped, while he's being taken out, he's saying, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. It is important that we cry out on behalf of ourselves, on behalf of our children, our wives, our husbands, our neighbors, our cities, our states our country and our world we have to cry out to the lord you ask not you receive not but whatever we ask whatsoever we ask if it is in accordance with god's will and jesus's will is that he didn't lose any of his own he doesn't want to lose any potential of people that will come to him but when god knows it's over and there's no more to be gained it's over we can always pray though that we have more time we can always pray that we have peace. The Bible says, if the prayers of the righteous availeth much, then the son of perdition may not come. We can keep pushing it back, people. It's not over till it's over. And God loves showing up at the last minute just to plow the enemy. Sometimes what seems like the darkest hour becomes the cracking of dawn. Amen. Amen. Starting in. 23:33 and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary they crucified him and the male factor on the right hand and a male factor on the left he had two guys beside him one on the right and one on the left 
it makes me curious sometimes because you had those brothers that came and uh, I believe the mother's request was, oh, let, let him be on the right side of you and the left side of you at glory. And I, I sometimes wonder, I sometimes wonder who those boys were. And he asked, is that a cup that you can bear? Surely you'll bear this cup. And, uh, but here we are. And that's just a, that's just a Jason thought. You can do what you want with that. But here we are. And here's a man to the right of him, a man to the left. And Jesus is in the middle. Then said Jesus, father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He said this to the crowd. He said this to the father openly to the crowd as he's watching as they're parting his raiment, as they're casting lots. And the people stood there beholding and the ruler is also with them. They were just standing there saying, oh, he thinks he's the son of God. Let him save himself. Let God come down and save him. And then the soldiers, they also mocked him. They were coming to him, offering him vinegar, trying to give him vinegar to drink. And saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And see, the subscription that was above him, it read, and it was in Greek, it was in Latin, it was in Hebrew. It said, this is the king of the Jews. And you see the malefactors, uh, which were hung and railed beside him. They were saying, if you're Christ, save yourself, save us, do something. But you see one of them, one of them was railing at him, just like everybody else. And he's crucified with these other two men. One's railing at him. And the other one says, Hey, wait a minute. He hasn't done anything. He hasn't done anything. We're, we're guilty. Leave him alone. And he's a, he's a righteous man. And you see, you have a criminal that's persecuting with the crowd, even though he's hanging with them. You have a criminal who recognizes who he is and defends him. He defended him in them. He defended him while on the cross, while being persecuted by the other man on the cross. Now, real quick, let's take a look at the same passage. We're going to go over to Matthew 27, I believe. So here we are. Back up a hair. Okay, going into Matthew 27. Oops. Yeah, Matthew 27 at 32. And as they came out, they were found a man from Cyrene, Simon. It's the same, it's the same Simon, the same Simon that was carrying the cross. They compelled him to bear the cross. Um, they gave him vinegar to drink. They mingled it with gall. Now, it didn't mention this in the other passage. I want to point this out. The gall, this is a, it's it's like a super alcohol. And they had wine back then to drink. The wine wasn't to get you blasted. It You'd have to drink a lot of wine because there was a small alcohol content, um, even if it was wine wine. For the most part, it was to sanitize water. But they would take vinegar and mingle it with gall. Gall is like super strong. And they would give this to people dying. So it wasn't an uncommon thing to give them something to keep them out of their misery. They'd still be miserable on the cross, but kind of to take the edge off, it, it would help die down the screaming is what it was for. And when he had ta tasted thereof, he would not drink. See, they put up his mouth. He, and uh, he wouldn't take it, though. He wouldn't take any of it. And, and they crucified him. His garments were parted. The lots were cast that it might fulfill, which was spoken by the prophets. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him from there. You know, Jesus went through this right here in Matthew. I want us to really understand, though, what Jesus was going through. So how can we understand this more? We can go into... Um, Psalms. So if you humor me here, let's back up into Psalms 22. All right. Now it's important to know after this, they, they split his garments up. They teased him. They mocked him. And uh, there's a point where he says just this. And it parallels what's spoken in Mark and Matthew. And 
Also Luke, for that matter, says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring, oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest me not. And in the night seasons, and I am not silent, but thou art holy. Oh, thou that inhabits the praise of Israel, oh, our father trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They were trusted in thee and were not confounded, but I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. Now, this is Jesus. These are the words of Psalms 22 written by David. It was a prophecy to the actual cross and Jesus on the cross and the emotions that he was going through. He says, but I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men. Men despised him like a worm. He was less than a man. To say to say you were a worm was to say that you were helpless. You're weak. You're helpless and, and despicable. Nothing. To be Raka, he's been treated like nothing. He's a worm. He's less than a man. A reproach of men and despised by all the people. This is the anguish going on in our Savior's heart right now. And he's going through all these motions. Because God will not put you through anything that he wouldn't do himself. You see, what he was going through is also the motions that Job went through. I think it might have been Job 6, but back in Job, Job saying, I am a worm. He was going through this. I'm weak. He was, he was stating his weakness, his frailty, his just absolute inability to do anything for himself. And now here's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on the cross to himself. This is internal. Because outside, what they heard was, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But internally, these are the things that were going through his mind, because these were also the Psalms that he was walking through in his mind. These were also the prophecies of David, of what goes on in the mind of Christ. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm, as no man, a reproach of men and despised of people. All that see me laugh at me. To scorn, they shoot out their lips. They shake their heads, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb, that didst make hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God, my mother's belly. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me. Lord, we ask that you be not far from any of us. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me about. Everyone was walking around him like bulls. They were splitting his garments, breaking straws over who got it. They were splitting up what he got before he was even dead. They just, you know, that'd be like someone taking inheritance before the person's dead. They just, oh, he's going to be dead soon. Let's just take his garments like he's nothing, like he's not even there. Like strong bulls of, of Bashina have beset me round. So these big people are just like bulls to him. They're crashing at him. They're laughing at him. They're mocking him. They're pointing fingers. They're shoving vinegar and gall in his mouth. They gape me upon. They gape upon me with their mouths as ravening and roaring lions. I am poured out like water, and my and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. You have to understand when you are being crucified, your bones are pulled out of their place you are pulled tight on there and they have your feet nailed through your tendons you it wasn't through his hands it was through his tendons so you have a nerve that runs up your back every time you would these tendons would make you clench you would jerk up and every time you jerk up then the tendons pulling down would make you jerk down so you couldn't get any comfort pulling up or down you were just constantly in agonizing pain no matter which way you went this is what our Lord did. 
He was crucified. He went through this for hours of agony, taking on the sins of the world and the pains of our hearts, the pains of our desires, the pains of our emotions, the pains of the things that we put him through. He still feels it. He still feels it for every single one of us. So don't think to yourself that sin is something that doesn't hurt anybody. Oh, secret sin. Scandal in heaven. Jesus feels it. Jesus feels it. You say, how do you know he feels it? Because he feels everything. A woman touched his garment. And he said, who touched me? Who touched me? He said, master, everyone's crowding in around you. What do you mean who touched you? He said, no, no, I felt virtue. Leave me. People, if, if Jesus feels the virtue, leave him off the garments that he wears. How much more does he feel the hurt from the things we go through? God cares. God cares. God doesn't care about your petty problems. God doesn't care about your silly worries. God doesn't care about your fleshly desires. God doesn't really even care too much how your mind, will, and emotions pan out as long as your spirit comes through with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what God cares about. He cares about you, not who people make you out to be, not who this person, that person say you should be, but who he made you to be. He doesn't even care about who you think you are. He wants you to be who he made you to be because he cares. He cares enough to walk up that hill. He cares enough to go through that struggle. He cares enough to bear that cross till he can't bear it anymore until someone just lifts it a little so he can keep going. He cares enough that while they're laughing him to scorn, spitting on him, thorns in his head, spikes through his tendons. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You can't tell me God doesn't care. He cares. He doesn't care about the things we care about, but he cares. He cares about the things we don't consider. He, can, he cares about the future that he has set for us that you've never seen. He cares about the desires that he has for us that you've never dreamed. He cares about not who you are, but who you're going to be. He cares not about who you were, but who you are now in Christ. Amen. We have to learn to crucify and put away the past. We have to learn to look at even those who have crucified us and forgive them and understand they know not what they do. We have to learn that Jesus has feelings too. He walked this earth as a man. No longer does God have a question from the devil saying, but you don't know what it's like to be human. He sure does. He will never give you more than you can handle. He said, I can't handle anymore. Well, he's topping you off. Why is he doing that? He's, he's making you strong. He's making you strong. Well, I can't take it. Then he'll send someone to spot you and help lift the weight. Say, I can't do it. Well, they're going to, their screams and the frustration will guide you there. Hey, everybody who goes up to bat has someone taunting them. That's probably pretty much because Jesus did too. You say, I've never gone through all these things in my life before, and I don't know how to handle it. Yeah. We'll handle it like the Lord, prayerfully. Take everything to the Father. You say, well, I'm not getting the answer back. Sometimes the answer is no and not yet. Sometimes things are so clear, we're just supposed to pick up on the word in front of us instead of a word from the air or a word from a preacher. Heck, so many people are always looking for somebody to tell them something when the word of God already has it laid out. Word of God already has it laid out. For dogs have compassed me. This is 16. Psalms twenty two sixteen. 16. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and store upon me. They're just pulled out of joint. They part my garments among them, and they cast lots upon my vesture. They're trying to guess who he even is. They don't even know. 
casting lots upon his vesture, upon his things. Is that even who he say he is? Is it? Is that really even Jesus? No, he's not the Son of God. Just tearing him down. Tearing him down. And that's the devil. That's the devil trying to convince him on the cross that he's not who he thinks he is. You see, Satan's always looking for reasonable doubt. He wants you to doubt your sonship. He wants you to doubt that you're a daughter of Christ. He wants you to doubt the authenticity of God's word. He wants you to doubt your faith. He wants you to doubt your hope. He wants you to give up your belief. Don't let him, people. Jesus didn't. And we can always hold in. Here we are in 2220. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dogs. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of all the congregation. I will praise thee, ye that fear the Lord. Praise him, all ye the seed of Jacob. Glorify him and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard, My praise shall be of thee in a great congregation. I will pray my vow before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. Amen. Amen. And the end of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindred of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. He is the governor among the nations. We may have a principality that tries to control things in every state, in every city, in every home. There's principalities trying to change the way things are. There's rulers of wickedness on high, but it is he that governs this world. Just as he told the people saying, don't you know your life's in our hand? He said, you can do nothing without my father's approval. You see, God lets things take the course. And in the course things take, God intervenes. He intervenes. And he intervenes through our mouths, through the actions of people. He uses mankind as the way to handle this world. I mean, you know, that's Jesus even showed up in the flesh because God sticks to his rule. If he says he's going to have man be the stewards of the earth, then stewards of the earth we are. And if he tries all of his prophets and they're not taken, then he sends his very own son. Then he sends his own son and he sends him in flesh so that he can account and say, yeah, I do know what it's like to be human. Yes, I do know what it's like. I know what they go through. I felt it before. I put myself to the test. And he does this so that he can turn around and put us to the test. But yet Jesus has done the walk. He has done everything that needs to be done for our salvation. So all we have to do is accept it. All we have to do is accept it. He's done all these things for us to, to realize that he died and rose on the third day for our salvation. He went through these anguishes in his life on the cross. You know, and, and you got to consider, he knew he was going there. He knew he was going there since the very first miracle of the Bible when he told his mother, what, what do I have to do with this wedding? I, I, that's not my time yet. He knew where he was going from, from the Garden of Gethsemane. He needed the strength to keep going. He needed to be lifted up so he could keep carrying that cross. He needed to cry out to the Lord in Scripture to hold his sanity against everything being thrown against him. He went through the pains of a man. He went through all of our suffering, but he only did what the Father told him to do. Amen. Amen. Psalms 22.30, a seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and they shall declare his righteousness unto the people. They shall be born that he hath done this. Or as Jesus said, 
there are ones that will come after that are greater. For greater is he who has never seen Jesus in the flesh and still have the faith. You see, the apostles, they bore witness to the miracles. But they bore witness to the miracles we've only read about, and they had faith. How much more is it for us to have our faith and have never seen? According to Jesus Christ, it's much more. It's much more. We are the army. We are the army of the Lord marching in this world. It is a late hour, and that darkness is upon us. But as my grandfather said, and I've said, and I will say again, on the plains of hesitation, bleach the bones of them at the dawning of victory, sat down to rest, and while resting, died. You can't give up, people. You can't give up on the Lord because he'll never give up on you. You can't give up on your salvation because it's not yours and you can't take it away from yourself. It belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ for his privilege. So don't even try. You can't jump out of God's hands. They're too big. He's not going to let you go once he has you. It's contractual. The devil wants a contract on something he can't claim in your soul. God wants the contract on your spirit. And by getting that, all you have to do is say, Lord, I want to be yours. I want to be yours. In fact, if you haven't accepted Jesus in your heart, and what I'm saying is moving you, making you think or consider your salvation. If you have salvation or you're not sure that you have, it wouldn't hurt to say this with me and just do it again. Lord Jesus, I know that you are the son of God. You died and rose on the third day to take up my sins. Father God, I ask that your son come into my heart and save me from all my sins. Lord Jesus, I make you my Lord from now on till all eternity. I ask you to be my guide, my savior, my way, my truth, and my life. And it's that simple, people. If you say these words and you mean it, then Christ is going to intervene in your life. You're on the road of salvation. Salvation doesn't start with the day that you're saved. Salvation starts the day that you die. That's when you're saved. But you have the earnest, and the earnest is given by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been laid down that you can accept salvation. It's just something to accept accept that Jesus wants to save you. You can't save yourself, but if you can accept that God wants to save you, Jesus said, believe on me, believe on me. If not for myself, for the miracles sake, we haven't seen those miracles, but if you believe, then greater are we than those who followed him. And if they laid hands on the sick, cast out demons, then how much more can we do by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. Well, people, God bless you and be well. I will see you next week. Amen.